So we're good. It is so. loading. <laughs> I'll let you know when it comes up. Okay. Okay, we are live. All right. Oh, wait, hold well, on one second. Not yet. <laughs> okay, now we're live. Are you hmm. sure? Live, live? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Welcome to the College of Architecture and Design lecture series at Lawrence Technological University. My name is Carl Dobman and I'm the Dean of the college. <clears throat> it's always a pleasure to introduce lectures and have people come and share their work with us. And so tonight we have Farzan Latfi Jam joining us. Uh, and and we, it's not always easy to find really good people to share the time with us in the lecture series because what's, what's exciting about the college is that it's a broad design, a set of broad design disciplines. And you can see the slide that we have open on the screen, a range of them, architecture, game design, graphic design, industrial design, interior architecture, soon to be named interior design, as well as transportation design. Yay. And we look for people to be able to cross those boundaries. And so it is a, it's, it's always nice to find people who can do that and help us generate more discussion internally within the college. And I would say that Farzan falls into that category. Um, Farzan's working between disciplines and doing it with a technology and media focus. I was also thinking about the topic. Well, I think one of the things that came about is that it's also exciting to announce that uh, Mars Ashton through our game design program recently received an epic grant uh, to work with Unreal Engine. And I think uh, maybe sometimes we stay in touch with one another through Instagram and other places. And I saw that Farzan had been also working with Unreal. And that was a kind of interesting thing for me to find that crossover. And, and I've also been thinking about this as it relates to uh, maybe kind of inflection points or different types of moments where we kind of transition from one thing into another. And, and often it feels like there's, there's such a, a rush to become the first to do something. But in terms of talking about real time issues that like, when are these, when are these moments when we find those, those tipping points or inflection points with quantities of something or speed of other things. And I think to be able to do something real time, one could critique that and say, okay, that's, that's no different, it's just faster. But I think Farzan will probably be able to talk to this issue about what it means to do something real time, I think can actually fundamentally change the way that we work. It can fundamentally change the way that we think about some of these things. Um, and so how do we, you know, as we work, as we explore new technologies, as speed increases, I think there are these opportunities to imagine new types of possibilities. And so I'm looking forward to, to Farzan sharing some of his work with us tonight. And so uh, I'll introduce him. Farzan Latfi Jam is director of Farzan Farzan. Uh, it's a multidisciplinary design studio working across architecture, urbanism, computation, and media. The examples that I saw that he was working, I was looking at urban issues, but using Unreal to do that. Uh, I've known Farzan for a number of years. He was a fellow at the University of Michigan. He's currently a faculty member at the Cooper Union and at Columbia, and he's hiding out in upstate New York. Uh, and so if you follow him on, on any social media outlet, you'll see him hiking and being outside during the winter, which is interesting to see that he got out of the city. Um, He's, he's currently the M plus Design Trust Research Fellow, and he looks at these issues of history and political impl implications related to spatial media and computation. His work is in a number of collections and it's been exhibited all over the world. It's in the collection at the Center Pompidou and the Sharjah Art Foundation. It's been supported by the Graham Foundation, the Academy Schloss Solitude, and the Shed, where he was the inaugural open call artist. He's exhibited at the Storefront for Art and Architecture in New York, the Maxi in Rome, the Venice Architecture Biennale, the Oslo Architecture Triennale, 
Istanbul Design Biennale and the Seoul Architecture Biennale and other places. So his work is, is critical, it's insightful, it's thoughtful, uh, and it's also been uh, exhibited and shown and picked up in a number of places. He also has, a, I think, a relatively new book called Modern Management Methods, Architecture, Historic Value, and the Electromagnetic Image. So I'd like to welcome Farzan tonight. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Carl, and thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Let me just uh, share my screen and share my face. Hi, can you all see, see everything? Everything's fine? Yeah, and you can see the top. Great, am I over there? Hi, everyone, so thank you so much for coming. It's, it's such a thrill to uh, virtually be in Michigan, um, a place that's very sort of fond and close to my heart and a place where um, a lot of the thinking that I'm actually going to show um, and talk about tonight actually first, um, you know, I first started to sort of develop those uh, thoughts. At, um, and, and so it's like wonderful to kind of come back here um, and um, be in dialogue um, with all of you and, and, and with Carl. And, to, you know, I was very excited when I learned about um, this, you know, multiple programs you have that are kind of looking at architecture and gaming design. Um, and, and so when Carl and I started to talk about this, I was really, you know, I think it's like very fertile ground and very excited to sort of uh, develop that area between us. So I'm doing like a little bit of an experiment tonight uh, to kind of combine um, a couple of like just to sort of live DJ many things uh, with my or VJ. Uh, and, and so the lecture I'm going to talk about is called Real Time Urban Simulations. Uh, and, and as uh, in order to do that, I'm going to try to do some sort of real time uh video mixing in some way because you know I'm, I'm kind of really interested in uh how technologies that are sort of operating us in this way uh how they sort of captivate our attention let's say and, and so i want to sort of see if i can uh play some of those moves um on you in some way and, and to kind of experiment in that in some way uh, you know maybe it'll be a gimmick but i hope not um and, and so today i want to show some recent work uh from uh, my practice uh, and my academic research. And, and this is just a loop from my website. This is the easiest way to show everything. It's just a Zoom recording. Uh, and so my practice in academic research um, as how media, uh, network infrastructures and uh, technological ideologies inflect the politics of architecture in the sea. Um, and so through my practice, I've developed an applied research methodology where I actively theorize the implications of technology uh, through, you know, making things and, in a, I guess, maybe a critical way and an experimental way. So thinking about a kind of a critical form making uh, methodology. And, and so in my practice, I, I kind of wear a lot of different hats and I, it's very deeply collaborative and everything I'm going to show you tonight is, uh, is uh, work that I've done in collaboration um, where um, I produce a lot of exhibitions. Uh, I, uh, I produce uh, different types of spatial media. Uh, we sometimes make sp smartphone apps like this project for the Oslo Architecture Triennale. Uh, we, we do research, we kind of invent um, technology and we fabricate, uh, you know, products. And, and, and so, you know, I think of my work as somehow, um, you know, my role is to uh, go a little bit ahead of uh, the field in some way and think about where, uh, where some things, you know, if, if something's emerging, uh, what the sort of political, um, social consequences of that might be. And, and often in order to do that, I find myself actually looking uh, back a little bit, kind of like uh, having to think about the longer trajectories of, of certain things. Um, so I hope you'll sort of entertain this methodology um, that I'm going to kind of talk about tonight. Um, and um, to, to do that, I'm going to uh, talk about three main things. Uh, I'm going to look at the history of uh, real-time computational systems and infrastructures and how complex environments, inhabitants, and the behaviors and relations have been theorized, uh, virtualized, and modeled through digital simulations. I think something really relevant for us are using a real-time sort of a platform like the Unreal Gaming Engine and what you're doing in your... Um, and, and so this is a kind of an area that's sometimes be called uh, the military commercial, um, the military entertainment complex. And so I'm kind of interested in how technologies sort of uh, circulate from between commercial spheres, military spheres, and you know what that means. Uh, and then I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, a, a collaborative project I've been working on with Mark Lasuda, uh, where uh, we've been sort of 
thinking about how a lot of these different uh, well, thinking about how a lot of these different forces have been converging in the last two decades on the city with the emergence of what uh, we call um, a, as a kind of a computational urbanism. And so I'm going to show you research we've done on two smart cities. Uh, and we're interested in how cities and their residents are being modeled as information and how as subjects of the city, uh, we're all becoming habituated to a computational logic. And, and so uh, thinking about that and what we're talking about as a sort of computational governmentality. And then if we get time and, you know, maybe I've put too many slides in, so I'm kind of, you know, I guess we, I'm, I'm wary of time, but if we get time, I, I really hope, you know, in question time, we can sort of think about uh, and reflect on what this means for the fields of digital studies, um, architecture and urbanism. Uh, so here's my next trick. Uh, if we kind of combine 1000 with, here you go, this is my eye cam. So you can sort of track my gaze and my attention uh, all night. Okay. Uh, but I wanna begin here with uh, these two recent forms of media. Uh, they both show the movement of bodies but in different ways. Uh, on the left is a data-driven narration of the coronavirus from the New York Times. The story consists of analysis and narration of cell phone data that informs a computer simulation of hundreds of millions of people's movement. Uh, to the right, we have the trailer for Humanity, a soon to be released PlayStation 4 game by Enhance and THA, where population management has truly become entertainment. I'm interested in these two media because they demonstrate two historically distinct techniques for modeling and simulating population behavior. One driven by statistical information and the other by theories of human behavior. Uh, okay, you ready? This is, this is the last, this is, we can't go past this point. Boom. So there we go. This is how I'm constructing this. Now you structures of this presentation. Um, and so speaking of the, in their front end and in their back end inf infrastructure. And so the front end of the New York Times um, is, um, is saying I have unstable connections. So let me know if I should um, speak more slowly. Um, the front end of the New York Times article is client side uh, JavaScript. It's using the 3.js and D3 JavaScript um, libraries to handle 3D and sort of visual information representation. Uh, but the front end of the New York Times uh, media is also indebted to a representation history, one that's been invested in forms of information visualization and different forms of management of data. The back end of New York Times is server side routing. And so there's a kind of a global architecture of uh, different data centers that sort of lattice our entire planet. But the back end of that um, of New York Times also is relying on a vast and pervasive surveillance infrastructure and on techniques of tracking collection. The front end of humanity is a 4K resolution MP4 file. Uh, let me go. Um, and so although it's a simulation, the front end is also indebted to a cinematic history, one point perspective framing to the development of camera pans, dollies and tracking shots. But the back end is also indebted to uh, GPU and CPU hardware development and to a theory of human behavior that yields decision making behavior at an actor agent scale. Uh, the programming of this theory has then been translated to an algorithm that can be reproduced on a computer. And so the reason why I'm interested in these two different media and in these two different ways of tracking and uh, uh, managing, anticipating the movement of our humans um, is that what this shows is how modeling algorithms are able to track subjects and to use this data to model behavior, um, thus deploying anticipation as a technique to shape both subjects and territories. And so this anticipatory logic is um, what I'm examining in my current work and what I'm interested in kind of thinking about a little bit with you tonight. Um, and so to begin, I wanna kind of start here with a project called Real Time. Uh, which is actually what we've been doing with that Epic, Epic Mega And so Real Time is a one year research and pedagogical project that I've been um, conducting with Greg Schlusner, um, the director of student researchers at the Cooper Union as part of um, our Mega Grant. Um, and so, you know, Epic Games are the makers of Fortnite. 
asked to use the software, their Unreal Gaming Engine, to think through architecture curriculum and tools. And so the project is a symposium that's been postponed, um, soon to happen, and an exhibition um, that we're installing Cooper, which you can see here. Uh, and, and so when we started to work on this project, um, we were kind of, you know, we were intrigued by this term real time that Epic uses to kind of market uh, their product, the Unreal Gaming Engine. And, and, you know, I don't need to tell you, but the Unreal Engine is self-described as the world's most open and advanced real-time 3D creation tool. Uh, and so we started to see this term everywhere and we were kind of intrigued and we wanted to find out more. Uh, Epic is marketing their tool to architects as a real-time 3D visualization workflow. Uh, here's a screenshot from Unreal Engine. Uh, they are celebrating its flexibility and time reducing capability. Uh, and they, uh, the, the tyranny of the endlessly spiraling V-Ray bucket and offline or not real-time 3D visualization package will go the way of the scanline event horizon. Um, but we thought that this term real-time and the paradigm of real-time computation, visualization, interaction and virtual experiences could address some additional concerns outside of architectural visualization. And that the paradigm of real-time computation and visualization has a longer history. And as with many technologies, a military one. And so we start here at, um, we begin our journey in 955, 58, sorry, in well-trodden scholarly terrain uh, with the semi-automatic ground environment or SAGE, as it's more commonly referred to, a Cold War military initiative. Um, there was a system of large computers and associated networking equipment that coordinated data from many radar sites and processed it into um, to produce a single unified image of the airspace over a wide area. Um, and so this is also the reason why digital real-time computation was invented. Uh, and so Epic's real-time platform is shaped by this example and the formation of real-time electronic computation through Cold War demands for centralized command and control over vast territories in a modular, flexible and efficient manner. And so for our project, we wanted to ask, what does it mean that our profession, our design tools, our metrics for productivity is shaped by this logic? But we're also interested um, in uh, how these logics start to map onto pop culture with global media events like this, uh, where Marshmallow, you know, hugely sort of huge EDM DJ played to um, uh, 10 million sort of uh, punters uh, in the Fortnite game. And so we're kind of thinking about where digitally mediated experiences and virtual simulations confront the economies of liveness. Uh, or how the design and planning of cities is coming under a real-time procedural modeling paradigm with a level of detail world generation logic. And so we're positioning the project that we've been developed between industry and um, academia, between the spheres that uh, Greg and I predominantly occupy, and we're asking how these tools of entertainment production are now becoming tools of design speculation and city management. And what are the consequences of them being informed by a military history? And so this is coming out of uh, five years of teaching at Columbia and at Cooper, where we've been working with students using Unity and uh, Unreal to uh, kind of think about, you know, how as architects, we can start to model uh, different urban sort of algorithms and narratives that are shaping the future of cities. And so this is some student work uh, here using agent modeling, a way to sort of model human beings moving to think about, you know, crowd simulations within a protest scenario, um, or students here are kind of um, actually using the Unreal Engine as an information visualization tool, um, using a historical um, archive of data about the um, financial market and starting to kind of combine that with other data sets. Um, or here where we're actually really um, using the Unreal Engine as a way to sort of simulate um, a kind of a narrative about urban life on the street and all these different types of uh, new urban infrastructures that are being developed by technology companies uh, to create different sort of street level management and experiences. And, and so here we're really thinking about it as a sort of a sort of non-linear narrative tool um, or um, here students are kind of um, taking uh, different data sets um, and 
actually creating a new way to represent waste uh, management infrastructure. So we're kind of like really, you know, through the teaching over the last five, six, seven years, we've been um, taking, you know, thinking of it as an analytical tool, thinking of it as an experiential tool, thinking of it as a kind of a planning tool um, and, and really kind of like not attempting to, um, you know, we're, we're <laughs> Uh, we're not we're not necessarily uh, you know architects making games where we're architects and urbanists kind of asking questions of the city and and finding this to be a wonderful tool to kind of um, do a lot of sort of uh, different forms of production and so that's kind of like to give you a sense of sort of the student uh, sort of history that informed this project and um, the exhibition itself that kind of uh, is going to show all the research and the work we've been doing it's in itself, it's a it's a kind of a real time system itself, and so this is the exhibition we install. Um, it consists of four chroma key rooms that will allow visitors to interact with four live simulations of different algorithmic narratives that the students have been producing. Um, each narrative is a synthesis of existing propositions for the future of the city that is being fueled by disruptive economic logics. Um, and so, in this exhibition, we're producing simulations of how the city is being simulated, uh, literally through, uh, you know, different computational models, but also uh, within our imagination through, you know, new images for what we think the future of a city should look like. Um, and, and so this is kind of coming out of a um, bunch of work I've been doing uh, uh, over a long time, looking at the logics of social media and this collaborative project with uh, Leah Dennis, where we were, I'm just going to let Hello, um, and, and welcome back to this uh, series, which is about how to make a paperweight. Uh, and so this project, York Cruise, was really looking at the what circulates between the logics of social media and the uh, 1990s, if you remember, MTV Cribs uh, show. Um, and, and so in, if in this project, we we're kind of thinking about how social media was reframed the domestic interior as a kind of a public um, as a public room and you know this is 2015 so obviously we all now are very aware of this in our zoom sort of life um, but this idea of framing um, a narrative within a kind of a technological uh, capture was something that informed our exhibition design and, and so here we're framing these different uh, algorithmic simulations and so we have these four scenarios um, the, first um, the first simulation is safe streets, where we're thinking about uh, ways the street is coming under technological sort of management, to the domestic optimizer, to the climate catastrophe, to the drone zone. And so we're trying to simulate all these different ways that the city is being thought about. And, and so this is some sketches of the installation. Um, it's going to open uh, in the next semester. So I welcome you all to come and have a look at it, where we're sort of running on, um, on four computers, all of these different simulations, and then we're chroma keying a visitor into it. So you have these two different views and you get to uh, interact with the simulations as a sort of decision maker, and then you're immersed in the worlds that you're creating at the same time. So you're sort of occupying both the position of someone who's creating uh, city and someone who's experiencing it. So there's a sort of a power I guess uh, there's a sort of a power uh, structure move that we're playing. Um, and so this is kind of just to, you know, this is all in progress and like in, in the sort of spirit of sharing our, exposing our sort of method a little bit, you know, to think about that you're all kind of going down this, is we, um, we kind of created all of these uh, research protocol packages where um, with students we were looking at all the different ways that uh, different ideas for this for different parts of the city were kind of being conceived and we started to protocolize uh, these scenarios into uh, object oriented sort of agent based um, modeling systems where we're thinking about all the actors are and and so um, the reason why we're using agent modeling is um, I'll kind of like explain that in a second but it's it's, it's a sort of a uh, primary technique for modeling human behavior that's been used by lots of different technology um, companies. Um, and so this is sort of some, you know, this is a safe street scenario where we're starting to assemble scenes. And I think this is like a really interesting paradigm that um, maybe architects are fully embracing now where design is uh, less about authoring individual things and more about authoring the assemblage of existing assets in some way. Um, probably something that 
gaming designers have known for a long time, but something that we're kind of becoming a lot more used to. So we're curating in some way. Um, and, and we started to sort of develop uh, some base level AI for the uh, for the smart streets, uh, uh, for the safe streets uh, scenario. We're, we're starting to think about, you know, how a car, how a pedestrian class, how a bicycle class could all start to interact with each other. Um, this is some uh, sketches of the uh, drone zone um, scenario where we're actually pulling in uh, all the sort of existing city data from city engine and procedurally modeling a part of we're starting to create uh, 3D path binding um, algorithms and, you know, wouldn't be if it didn't drop uh, seats into the sky. Um, but, but, you know, we're kind of start, it's really important for us to uh, both technically figure out how these different sort of agents might uh, navigate the city and just sort of replicate the same kind of, I guess, uh, technological behavioral systems that some of them have, but to also do that in a way where we're really looking at like the cold hard reality of what these objects look like in the city. And so that's why we're sort of pushing for this like incredible sort of level of realism. Um, and, and so this is the behavior tree that drives the simulation that you just saw be before. And the reason why we're using agent modeling um, is that this is the method um, being used by engineers, by planners, by technologists to model human behavior and different scenarios. And, 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 and so in the drone zone, we're kind of looking at that in some way. Um, and so if we sort of return to that humanity trailer now, uh, we understand that the technologies that are kind of driving uh, this simulation is an agent-based modeling system. Um, and so there's kind of just like very quickly, there's a sort of wonderful, you know, prehistory to all of this uh, within, you know, a lot of these techniques, as I mentioned, have been developed. Uh, there's been a reciprocity between commercial gaming and military gaming. And so we've been looking at kind of serious games uh, a form where military are kind of developing games for the purposes of training and to do, to model different sort of theater of war scenarios uh, where all these kind of tools that, uh, we're using a kind of helping create different types of sort of distributed combats. Um, and, and there's this like incredible sort of prehistory to a lot of these digital um, board game, um, digital video games that comes out of uh, actually uh, a, a kind of a board game um, culture where people were playing multiplayer games through the US postal system. And so you would kind of like make your move and then you would send it, send it through the post to the next player. And so this game, Tactics 2 by Avalon Hill, is actually the, one of the first times where this system they inve invented where territory and combat came under a sort of a probabilistic modeling paradigm where it could be calculated. Um, that system is something that then makes its way into the military um, and um, gets developed and, and, you know, they test their system reconstructing sort of historical conflicts. And, and so, you know, we're really, interested in this first moment where the hexagonal map of kind of territory and terrain that we're also familiar with uh, was first invented as a way to simulate uh, the possibilities of combat. And, 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 and so we can kind of, you know, we've been just tracking the hexagonal map as it's moved uh, from a board game to a P early PC game to the kind of games we might be playing now to the ways uh, cities are being represented as well. Um, and so there's this incredible history. Uh, there's, a, there's the Avalon General, this like publication that was uh, the, uh, um, the makers of the board games we put out. It's just like incredible. And so we've been sort of really interested in the cultures around this military, um, this early sort of war gaming and, and, and what of those cultures are still part of us and where they started to first emerge um, and, and where they've kind of landed with uh, Probably a lot of you know this, the America's Army was a game that was produced by the US military um, as a kind of a recruitment and public relations uh, exercise. And it was like a wildly popular uh, tool for that. And, and so we've been kind of, um, you know, if I've sort of, oh, if up till now I've been kind of like showing you uh, what circulates between the military um, and between commercial spheres and, and trying to kind of uh, set up a, a way to sort of understand all of these um, different sort of circulation of ideas and techniques. Um, 
now I want to sort of show you how some of those things have informed some of my thinking. And, and so um, a lot of these sort of developments of virtual um, simulators is um, something that I was looking at in a sort of project that I was working on um, with Mark Masuda. And so uh, it, this is an installation we did for the Istanbul Design Biennial, Biennial called No Stop Classroom. Um, and the sound will sort of introduce the project itself. Please pay attention. Please give us your attention. In this course, we will ask you to pay attention. Please look at the fixation cross on the screen and follow the circles that flash. This is a multiple object tracking test. This and similar tests examine our ability to notice changes in our visual field, how we sense such changes and perceive alterations, anomalies, and patterns is the basis of what we call visual attention. We are not always asked to give our attention. Often it is taken. A century of experiments on human perception, concentration, and distraction, has led to the conclusion that we are only marginally in control of our attention. If control is the paradigm of our era, audiovisual attention is its primary tool. Our attention is the subject of control. Please give us your attention. Uh, and so this installation is a two-track uh, video piece with a two-way mirror glass in between where we're playing. Uh, one track is dolling into a historical environment and another one is dolling out. And there's a moment where the two cameras overlap where a kind of an analysis is produced. Uh, and, and so as part of this, we were looking at eight historical environments where we think particular techniques uh, uh, were being developed to sort of manage your attention through the sort of primacy of large screens of different sorts. Um, and, and so we're kind of looking at this history of, you know, this the Linksys, sort of one of the first military um, simulators used to train for um, combat. Um, and we're starting to look at the architectures of, um, of these, you know, these training spaces. Um, and we started to, um, and so here's a kind of an example of one of those spaces, the mission control uh, room um, for NASA. Paragon of human, computational, and audiovisual interaction. The image of massive display screens facing a team of operations specialists, scientists, and other Cold War characters implied to the world watching that the exercise of national, territorial, and interstellar control occurred through the authority of control screens and control vision. This is a diagram of control vision. The console operator selects the background image in the information to be plotted. The NASA computers retrieve information from remote stations and the selected background maps or graphs. The plotting station inscribes data onto a slide by removing opaque material. Light that passes through the slide is reflected off the rear optical fold mirror and is then superimposed on the background image. As updated information is received, the slide plotter removes additional material to generate a high-resolution depiction of spacecraft movement and changing conditions. NASA's invention of the scribing slide projection sits at an evolutionary juncture for visual attention systems. The computers directed the inscription of graphic information, but only an analog projected image could achieve the resolution required to communicate with the entire mission control center. The central screen image identified mission priority and superseded the molecular forms of information present on the terminal screens. Here visual attention was the product of image resolution and assured a hierarchy of command and control operations. Uh, and I'll show you just one last one to give you a sense of the range. This is for because of its pronounced educational ambition, when the children's television program Sesame Street first appeared, it attracted the interest of audiovisual teaching and developmental experts. 
In the early 1970s psychologists Daniel Anderson and Stephen Levin conducted tests of children's visual attention. In the test Sesame Street was one source of attraction, and common children's toys were the other. The testing lab resembles a comfortable domestic interior, organized around a television. A video camera is positioned behind a glass partition obscured by curtains. Episodes of Sesame Street play on the television. Children test subjects alternate between watching Big Bird and playing with toys. An observer tracks their attention with a toggle device that records and processes when they look to Sesame Street and when they look away. Using this data and video footage, the study generates attention graphs, indicating which scenes, objects, and voices most attract the subject's notice. Anderson and Levin's observer operating the toggle switch can serve as a figure representing the contemporary, perpetual recording of our interests, attractions, and distractions. We often think of control as amorphous and elusive, but it is also formed around precise concepts and techniques. This is a course about the technologies and situations through which our visual attention is focused and toggled. Please pay attention. Uh, <laughs> let's go to this one. Uh, and so a lot of these, uh, I guess, research themes and threads that I've been showing up till now, thinking about uh, how technologies observe and manage um, human bodies in urban centers and cities, uh, how different types of media kind of operate on us and uh, hold our attention and, and how as an architect, we might start to uh, do perform an analysis of uh, some of these different forces while speculating and producing um, experiences ourselves. And so um, this project, Some World Games, that uh, was the winning competition for the Closed Worlds competition um, at Storefront for Art and Architecture um, the, for, uh, for an exhibition that was curated by Lydia Calipolati uh, on a, kind of a history of closed world systems. Um, for this project, we kind of had to uh, propose a contemporary uh, closed world prototype. And, and so um, in the exhibition, there was a kind of a long uh, it was an archive of a long history of different types of closed systems from sort of early scuba diving um, apparatuses to spacecraft kind of uh, self-contained uh, environments. Um, our project, we were interested in how uh, the human subject was now part of a kind of a closed information uh, loop. And, and, and so we were sort of, um, in 2016, we were kind of using virtual reality, uh, a technology was kind of fast coming on um, at that time in a commercial sphere. Um, as a way to kind of think about uh, how we could place a visitor to the gallery, to the exhibition within a kind of a closed information system. Um, and so as part of that, we kind of produced these custom uh, VR headsets uh, where we developed our own um, actual, um, you know, we kind of developed all the hardware and everything using Android phones. And, and this was early VR where there wasn't any sort of location um, tracking yet. And so we built this um, architectural sort of mechanical um, apparatus as a way to control where the body would be and to create a sort of a VR experience that would uh, synthesize a, a virtual world with a physical world. Um, and, and so this is the kind of uh, the, the seven head Said, um, you can see that at the top there's a kind of mechanized uh, looping um, uh, uh, track that sort of pulls people by their head and um, moves them around and gives them this experience. Um, but we sort of kind of designed that once you put the headset on, everything was really soft. It was a really sort of enjoyable experience. But as a museum visitor, um, you had to make a choice if you wanted to participate. And if you wanted to somehow be put on display as part of the exhibition um, yourself. And, and so this is just a little video that shows you. And so you can see uh, you're looping around. There's actually sound here that's missing, but that's okay.
And so when you, um, the VR experience kind of allowed you to um, access and have a sort of experience of the exhibition in a different way. Um, and so this kind of long history of looking at simulators and looking at ways distributed uh, forms of simulation could occur um, has a sort of obviously has a military history as well, right? With this program SimNet, um, there was um, there was a ten year sort of uh, initiative in the from 1980s to mid 90s to produce a distributed interactive um, form of simulation where if some sort of enemy aggression was detected in the physical world, uh, there could be a kind of a virtual simulation where. Uh, personnel could sort of model different forms of responses. And, and so this is the kind of architecture of, um, of, of that um, initiative. And these are sort of some of the early kind of industrial design tests where we're seeing um, Ulf Helgensen, the industrial designer, developing these combat training um, simulator models. And, and this is kind of like, you know, 1989. So I just want you to, for some of you who've like maybe played uh, Doom 1 that came out much later that and you remember the graphics of that, I just want you to kind of like, you know, I'm going to show you sort of what this, um, what these simulators were like um, and to tell you, sort of to show you how sort of advanced it was at the time. And by the aviation crewmen who were flying the helicopters at Fort Rucker. Okay, bravo, we finally killed it. As we flew over, the USS Wasp icon that we saw in our screens, our signal showed up on their radar screens, which is an amazing feat when you think about it. We had Army, Navy, and Marines all playing in the same network on their own systems. That's the first time that has ever been done. Uh, and so this is the, you know, this is the protocol that came out of us, the, the sort of DSI protocol that now drives lots of sort of massive online multiplayer simulations, some of which you might know. And, and so, if, you know, this is the kind of latest, uh, what those technologies look like now. Um, and, and this is early 2000 kind of simulator models. And, and so once again, you know, these technologies that we're now using within the commercial sphere, um, many sort of decades before, they already were kind of being used uh, for different forms of military combat. And so if all shapes of our kind of life have been uh, sort of touched by these early military technologies, uh, are they sort of part of, you know, our cultures right now? And, and so we're kind of interested in never kind of forgetting some of these histories. And, and so if we look at now, if we return to SAGE and we understand its kind of infrastructural idea that with SAGE, we kind of, you know, first model this massive infrastructure to track and monitor um, all forms of movement within a kind of controlled airspace. Uh, then we see that in SimNet, uh, a kind of an infrastructure of internet war was invented where uh, we're now not just tracking everything that's happening in the real world, we're also tracking everything that could possibly happen in alternative future worlds. And, and so if we kind of return back to our first two media, uh, and, and we kind of see that uh, on the left with the sort of New York Times article and humanity, that these two sort of military um, uh, histories and these two distinct infrastructures um, have informed these two media that we're consuming now. And so where it's really interesting for me is that these two forces have now started to converge over the last 20 years uh, on the city uh, with uh, products like this, um, a digital twin uh, of uh, virtual Singapore, where um, logistics uh, companies and you know, many of the same actors that we've seen before as many as are starting to uh, offer this up to the city as a form of urban management. And, and so now what happens is the city itself is starting to come under this kind of uh, tracking and simulation uh, infrastructure. And so for those of you who don't know what a digital twin is, um, the basic idea is the same as um, some of what we were seeing in Sydney, where uh, you're going to produce a virtual replica of a physical city connected with uh, different data sensors. Um, and, and, and so you're starting to basically attempt to uh, sync up a virtual model with a physical sort of reality and use that virtual model to uh, manage the city, but also uh, do scenario planning. And so obviously, once again, we see the crowd simulation, that agent modeling coming in again. Um, and, and so um, just to kind of finish up, uh, thinking about sort of where these like massive um, uh, simulations of, of populations are going, um, 
there's a kind of you know a way of modeling things that urban planners are using called synthetic populations where entire uh, cities worth of human beings are being modeled in a computer simulation um, down to you know down to the level of me and you and Carl uh, where there's virtual models that are starting to uh, track the different decisions everyone's using and so obviously this is about a sort of a marketization and a capitalization of human behavior and decision making and maybe some of you have been tracking this recently there's a kind of um, where this is really sort of coming in now is uh, with a product that has been um, developed by replica it's a sidewalk labs uh, offspring uh, where they're taking location tracking data from cell phones and other sources and using that data to produce virtual models of human behavior and then they're kind of creating massive virtual simulations of humans using cities and then they're selling that back to um, city planners as a tool to help you decide you know where people are going to kind of what the sort of mobility rates and the different um, ways of transport people are using and so we're kind of getting this like massive infrastructure where google you know, potentially Google, but they're not disclosing, is um, is extracting uh, data on you. It's being sort of cleansed through this virtualization where it's being, it's not just being uh, de-identified for location, but it's also somehow, you know, we can get a granular level of human behavior and patterns of life. Uh, and then it's okay to use that, in, um, that data in some way. And so I guess, you know, I think we're, I'm gonna sort of wrap it up here um, rather than go into the last segment. But just, you know, where, it's, where I'm kind of like super interested in these things is this isn't just a kind of controlling of uh, city movement and behavior uh, by um, technology the system. This is also a controlling of our imagination, right? Like what does it mean that as decision makers, as experts, as uh, entertainment consumers, as gaming lovers, as, you know, space makers, our entire idea of what a city is, our entire idea of how we make decisions, how we reason, how we evaluate requires, you know, massive amounts of kind of uh, tracking and a real-time kind of computational infrastructures around us. And so there's something that kind of captivates us about that. Um, and, and, and so I'll kind of like uh, leave it there for now. And if in question time or things come up in the city, um, we've kind of addressed some of those things, but you know, I'm really interested in these multiple kind of things that are happening where um, what we think of as a city is now being driven by uh, the ideas that have been fed to us um, by these kind of real time infrastructures. Um, thank you very much. So I guess we'll we'll take some questions. Emily, I think you're also monitoring YouTube, right? Yes, I am. <laughs> so Farzan, maybe I'll I'll kick us off. Thank you. That's a, you covered a wide range of things. Uh, but now we just lost you. We had too many Farzans and now we have just one. Uh, here we go. Yeah, you need to stay there. <laughs> All of you. Um, I thought it was kind of interesting, just given some of the things that we're dealing with in, a, in one of my classes, just drawing and representation. And so you're talking about these technologies and the exhibitions that you're doing, deal with them in real time. But some of the drawings that you showed are super black and white and technical. Is that, how are you, how are you thinking about those? Or, you know, I know these things are intentional. I know you think about them. Yeah. Um, sorry, I was so busy looking at the three images of myself. I, <laughs> I need to repeat was, the question now. <laughs> yeah, I, just totally, I was just like, is that what my nose looks like? And I totally <laughs> forgot. Sorry, could you just, I heard the end of it. Could you give me the start? <laughs> the, you, you showed us a number of different technologies and so many of them deal with real time. And I think it begs the question about how architects or designers represent their work. And your exhibitions deal with these things in a, in a very immersive, deep, 
real time way. But then when you showed us some of the drawings for say an upcoming exhibition, it's, it's still a, a very, it's like a very technical black line on a white page type of thing. And so how are you thinking about these and you know, how you represent your work and how do you, how do these things play out? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Uh, thank you for saying it again. I, I guess, the, no, I guess the question is kind of like, I'm reading it as, I think like one of the things we can do as architects is we can perform a spatial analysis. And, 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 and so we can kind of do that, and, you know, we have the ability to uh, synthesize, I guess, lots of different things. Uh, but when we understand technical systems in the same way that we understand building systems, you know, if, and we can kind of draw those up to a level where we've trained ourselves as a discipline over a long time to be able to kind of uh, correlate what a technical detail means in terms of the experience of that room at, at different scales. And, you know, I think about it in that same way, right? That the reason why um, there is so much kind of uh, need to sort of uh, describe what's happening in five centimeters of, of, of space is that that five centimeters is doing so much work. And, and so, but, but that's five centimeters isn't something abstract, right? That five centimeters is these particular types of material uh, objects that are connected to these very sort of material things. And so I the reason why some of those technical diagrams look that way is that um, I'm trying to combine uh, how we, you know, how objects sit within a kind of a media system and how we sit within that system and how those things start to all kind of uh, impact and shape each other in some way. Um, and so that's kind of, yeah, I think there's no way to, yeah, I haven't found a way to get away from the axonometric to do that. Like it's been really helpful to, you know, both objectify, but uh, contextualize things and put them in relation. So then it might be the difference for you. It's kind of the difference between articulating the the objects and then something the experience is something other, right? Which I think maybe it gets back to your earlier point that you made as well about just um, deployment of assets as a way of thinking about the way you know, that is a kind of change in the way that we're probably conceiving our work these days. Yeah. No, I think like it's a lot of different. Yeah, that's a. Like, it's, you know, I think um, there's a lot more kind of curation in our lives, right? Like we're all being asked to curate our lifestyles on social media, right? Uh, there's, we're all, you know, this term curation. Like I remember when people would, you know, you curate kind of uh, different um, streams of sort of, you know, a Tumblr sort of stream that might be like a dedicated curator for that. So I think there's a kind of, you know, there's a cultural, sort of um, expansion of curation that's entered lifestyle connected to this sort of like way more readily available assets. And, and so it's like somewhere between assemblage, how do we like assemble lots of things? How do we like curate them as a kind of cultural um, expression of taste and sensibility and desire? But then also you open up the Unreal Gaming Engine. Why would you 3D model a tree or a car or the facade of a building ever again, right? And so I think that that's kind of, you know, that somehow all of those things are kind of coming together. And, 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 and as architects, we've probably been, you know, on one level, the stock asset library that we all use, there's, there's been a lot of revisiting um, some of those assets to think about representation and how, you know, more diverse types of lifestyles could be expressed in the things that we put into our images without thinking. But at the same time, I think there's a lot of things we could put into our images that come from these assets libraries that maybe we could think about a bit more. And so maybe authorship is changing a little bit and maybe, I don't know, it's getting more collaborative. And yeah, there's a lot of other people's labor that I showed today that I'm not in any way acknowledging because I don't know who they were that produced all that work.
I'm assuming there's other questions or I'm giving a chance for other questions. <laughs> Maybe this is the second dialogue of my day where I was <laughs> hosting a different speaker earlier in the day. Does it change? I have a question. If Carl, Please, Aaron. <laughs> I know. Hey, Farzan, thank you um, for your presentation. I have a, a kind of a curiosity in general about the idea of having like perpetually embedded proprietary softwares within like out, outcomes or outputs or something like that, like the idea of a of a real engine being a sort of sort of like in architecture terms, like a life cycle affiliate with with the thing. And I was just it's a it's a it's a curious it's a question. Um, like, are there, in your opinion, implications of having those kind of embedded life um, cycle partnerships with those proprietary softwares or whatever within the within the output? Does that make sense? Uh, am I understanding? Hey, Aaron, thanks for your question. It's all uh, good. Am I understanding correctly? You're kind of asking, like, what it means when projects or buildings or cities are being sort of uh, the 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 kind of the nest the, they require some sort of proprietary private software to be part of. Um, their application or to be part of them being produced in some way. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? Is I think that, that yeah, I mean, I think that could be a two part. Like, I think that could be an expansive take, but I mean, even quite literally, as I've worked and collaborated with some folks who, um, who also deal in game engines, they would always just initially try and frame some concern about like intellectual property rights, uh, licensing, if the thing you make turns into like, a profit generator, for example, does Unreal, for example, like take some kind of copyright, some kind of payment, you know, <clears throat> that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, like I think it's kind of a, like to, to Unreal, it's, it's an interesting, let me just turn this up because I think it's killing me. One sec. Exit. And then let me do this. Okay. Uh, hello, welcome back. Uh, yeah, like Unreal is an interesting one, right? Because for a long time they would license their uh, software uh, and it would be used by other people to kind of make AAA games. And at some point they went from being, you know, I think they're sort of an engineering company from what I understand. And they were just, Fortnite was so wildly profitable and popular that they kind of changed their licensing terms and they're sort of giving away Unreal um, for like a, for many use cases for free. And I think they also um, went and started to hire a lot of people who used to work at Autodesk who um, left Autodesk. And so the people we've been dealing with who, who've been kind of fantastic, uh, they're in charge of trying to figure out how architects, engineering, construction people can start to use their, um, use their package. And so they're really actively engaged in building new tools, uh, new forms of curriculum, new applications uh, for the Unreal Gaming Engine for, for, for you know, people in our industry. Um, but it's a kind of, yeah, it's an interesting one. Like they have the problem of having been too profitable or something, I don't know. And, and, and so I don't know, like, like you could read it as they need to, if they've based, if entertainment has been absolutely dominated. They need to enter into other industries. And, and so that's kind of, you know, like from what I understand that there's no sort of sinister implications. Like I think it, it is a sort of uh, what else can we do? Who else can use this? We have a really great tool that we've only used in these ways. Um, can other people, can other folks start to use it in different ways? And that's why uh, at the start, I showed a lot of student works that used it and, you know, used it to just make a film used it to sort of do data visualization of like, you know, uh, bespoke kind of data sets, used it to make, you know, interface and use it to make, you know, lots of sort of different forms of complex simulations. Um, so I think uh, for us, like, you know, at some point if they change their licensing model and we've all become really kind of dependent on it, 
<laughs> I suppose that's what I'm. I suppose that's what I'm getting at. I mean, I, I yeah. recognize like the idea of like expanding into um, additional markets. Yeah. Um, and sort of like giving everyone a free haircut to like learn about their, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like the way that they're going to yeah. operate. But then I wonder like to become so deeply interdependent on the proprietary engine at a certain point, they would want to return on that investment. And somehow I'm, it's not a skepticism or a pessimism. I just wonder like what that, you know, just purely like speculation, like what that starts to turn into as a financial model relative to architecture. Yeah. You know? No, it's a good question. And like, I can't, I'm not sure. Like I haven't spe- thought about it that much. Unreal is kind of, I've been really thinking about where real time technologies have come from. And, and so where I've been really thinking about where they're going is more looking at the privatization of the city, looking at how, I don't know, like 20 years ago, um, technology companies changed their strategic sort of interest from designing software for users to designing cities for citizens. And, and so this has kind of been, you know, the smart city movement that's been coming on. And so um, that last sort of example I showed, the replica platform is a key kind of um, key example of that, I think, because it's, it's doing exactly what you're saying, which is that's a software as a service product where I think the Illinois just went into a 3.6 or something million dollar multi-year licensing agreement with Replica, uh, which means that, and, and, and Replica's kind of, uh, you know, they're still developing their tool, but as part of the agreements with cities, they're going to get access to city data and to their data sets to help refine, to validate and to further sort of develop their tool. And so part of, so, so that is going to do probably exactly what you're saying, right? Like cities are going to become so dependent, you know, whether dependent as a necessity, right? Do, do, do I need to have a model of every single person in my city's movement patterns in a simulator world to make a decision about, you know, where the bike lane goes? Am I excited by that prospect? Is it exciting to watch lots of human beings move around at that scale? You know, it's, it's show, kind of like what I was showing with some of those earlier media things. So, so I think there's a kind of data, you know, fever that, that you know, there's, there's kind of like trends of vast sort of big um, data is meeting uh, the desire for all, all of us to, I don't know, like just watch human beings move <laughs> in virtual simulations. And, and so that, you know, we, we can kind of pretend that that doesn't operate on us, but uh, I absolutely, when I make these little worlds of my own, I'm enamored by them. And I, I, I can kind of objectively try to argue for why it's doing some sort of work that's uh, analytical or it's kind of quantifying something or it's performative. I can tell you it's optimizing something, but I, the, there is a pleasure in playing with it. And that pleasure of playing with virtual humans is being monetized at many different scales for many different industries. Uh, thank you, Vardzim. As uh, we're nearing the end of our uh, lecture series, um, are there any other questions that anybody has for Vardzim? Since you got rid of your other cameras, Farzan, we can see your your silver coat in all of its glory now. Yeah. Before it was blurry. I've got, I mean, I've got a lot more questions. Um, it's, an, it's all interesting and provocative. Uh, let me just ask another, again, just a speculative kind of ponderance, whatever, but oftentimes this, the, uh, you know, these conversations center around cities. And I wonder if um, like, like if there is some kind of counterpart or thought, maybe not around suburban conditions, but even like, like rural conditions, especially now as we're just thinking so much about, at least from the news's perspective, like notions of two types of America, two types of 
you know, reality or whatever, as it's all perceived as a kind of like media broadcast. I just wonder like how you think about some of these scenarios aside from super urban real time, as opposed to like a counterpart, maybe being like super rural real time or something like that, <clears throat> or if you've thought about that. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, like I haven't thought about that exactly specifically, but I would just start with, I guess like when I was talking about the infrastructure to create experiences and you know, the infrastructure that created that New York Times article laces the planet and probably, you know, there's, there's kind of uh, data centers, there's, there's uh, large facilities, there's, there's architectures in, I would say many different contexts on rural to urban to suburban. And, and so that's driven by um, a totally different uh, urban sort of algorithm than the ones we might be used to, right? Like that's driven by proximity to network infrastructure, uh, cost of land, and uh, how cold is it or something, right? And, and, and so that's a totally different matrix that's shaping it doesn't care whether it's urban or suburban or rural, right? It, it just cares about uh, do I sort of optimize against these requirements and wherever I land, I land. And and so I would kind of say, yeah, like that the the city and the you know the country have co-produced each other, and they're they're one thing, right? It's it's not that uh, that what happens in one impacts the other. So I would kind of say that. And to the real time thing, I think it's like a yeah, like I would say it's not just like there's a urban reality and a rural reality. I say there's just like there's infinite realities, right? That's what we've kind of um, we've all been learning and, and what we've all suspected for a long time. And uh, there's if 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 we now have uh, platforms like Replica that take the location behavior from 30% of a city's cell phone users and use that to abstract away behavior model for different types of virtual personas that then virtually move kind of like what we do this is just what we are now getting as like the lower level public product from those technology companies right and that's been sort of marketed to city planners as a uh, as a utility so who even knows what they know with a hundred percent of the city's kind of cell phone data um, that are being kind of, you know, the, the personas of those virtual models are not just humans moving around transportation infrastructure, but humans doing all sorts of other parts of their life. And so, you know, that's a kind of paranoid uh, sort of surveillance capitalism kind of view of all that maybe. Uh, but I think like where I'm also curious and very sort of sensitive to try to understand is Things, if we understand like sinister things are bad, right? We're all being tricked. Uh, we're all being tracked by vast machines and we all suspect like they know more about us than we do in aggregate. Um, things that are kind of more benign when something is just supposedly a simple apolitical uh, urban infrastructure, you know, where um, someone's, you know, sidewalk labs was going to design a smart city in Toronto, right? And it was going to, uh, the kind of arguments for all of that was around how it was going to be convenient and it was going to be safe and it was going to be a really sort of smooth new urban experience. And and, and so supposedly the technology is apolitical, it's, it's, it's not sinister. Uh, so I think like I've been trying to, through my work to also find seemingly benign examples of something that is like, traffic engineering and show how that has a political dimension, that that sort of circumvents certain previous democratic processes or it further sort of, you know, um, it further uh, erodes uh, us as uh, citizens of the city and turns us as kind of information vectors within a computational sort of system. I don't know, so I've been kind of thinking about, you know, I think like in that spectrum between sinister and benign, like it's all, uh, it all has kind of impact on uh, how we live in cities and the future of cities. Yeah. I, I also wonder to Aaron's question, like the, posing that and not that it's 
two separate things, like you suggested, Aaron, but like nature potentially moves at a different time scale. And so I just think about in the way that you talked about cities, as far as in the, the, the data and the immediacy and the, the urgency of the data and the kind of speed that comes with that versus not that we don't need data maybe at a, at a more natural scale, which might deal with more conservation issues and, and resource issues, but maybe they're just not moving at that same rate of speed. And so the, the, the digital twin, which seems a necessity, I mean, you argue in a really compelling way, the need for the digital twin, but they may just be different temporal models of different types of digital twins too. A slow, a slow one and a fast one. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Yeah, I like the the different, yeah, the different scales of real time. I don't know, right? Right. And, <laughs> yeah, the planetary scale. Yeah, the domestic scale, the city scale. Yeah. That's I nice. mean, yeah, I think that's 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 kind of what I was thinking about too. Is less, you know, the all we've kind of been hearing relative to the media is like divided America, you know, and like all of a sudden graphs and charts and things like that. I don't necessarily agree either, but um, spending a lot of time in like all of those kind of scenarios, cities, rural areas, whatever, it's just something a lot of the time the representation of this as a topic always kind of converges on in, intense density, um, intense urban systems. And I just, just general curiosity, like how that starts to connect and interface with counterparts, whatever, at your point, slower places, things like that. But it's super interesting to hear about like how they all can be considered on a like benign, sinister spectrum towards political ends, even in the forest or whatever. I think that's really interesting to think about. And, and I think we're learning too that those benign those seemingly benign things can be the most destructive, right? If we, if we know it's sinister, we can actually combat it. But if it's, if it's not, it just behaves in the background and does, does the damage that it does. Super interesting, Farzan. It's great to see you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was really nice to get the chance to sort of share this in progress work and some of the sort of more recent sort of finished projects with you all and this yeah yeah i could talk about this for a long time it's like incredible kind of set of questions well i think we i think we should probably find some ways to to connect on it more and i think we've got different constituents of student groups at ltu that that would benefit from some of what you're working on too and if they weren't here tonight they'll probably see it soon enough uh that'd be awesome yeah we really and like i'm super yeah like you're it's the first time I've seen a school that has both game design and architecture. And so I'm just like that, like, and transport and transportation, which is, yeah. So like something is happening there, which is like my three things. So I'm very glad. That's, that's <laughs> also what, what pulled me here too, to be able to talk about design in a, in a really interesting kind of cross cutting way between all these things. And so we're, we are trying to curate these kind of conversations and I think your, your work helps us to advance that. So thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Farson.